Okay, all yours, Sandy. I'm just going to go on mute. All right, very good. Give me one more moment to get set up because I also want to make sure I have the chat window open over here and that I can see everything else in all of my different windows. So, all right. Looks like the recording has started, so let's get underway. Welcome everyone to Missing Indexes Do's and Don'ts. So my name is Andy Yoon. I am a field solution architect with a company called Pure Storage. You may have heard of us uh, in the infrastructure world and whatnot, but for what it's worth, I've been working with SQL Server for a very long time. Uh, most of this is fluff on the uh, uh, bio slide here. The, really, the most important thing is my contact information. I'm fairly active on Twitter. My email address is all down there as well, and, uh, and my blog as well. So I love to talk to folks. I love to answer questions. I love to just talk shop because I just love SQL Server in general. General. So feel free to hit me up on any one of these different channels. Also, the other important thing to remember is my GitHub. Really, all you have to do is just remember SQL Beck, B E K, which is my online alias. Um, underneath uh, my GitHub, you can find all of my code, my sample databases, and all that other good stuff. Okay, so let's get underway. So to set the stage, let's think to ourselves what do you think about whenever you see this? particularly the green text. Hey, there's a missing index recommendation here. Now, over the course of my uh, career, longer than I care to admit, I thought a lot of different things about this particular little recommendation. When I first started as a uh, working with SQL Server, I thought, oh, hey, it's a missing index recommendation. This is pretty cool. I should follow this because, hey, the SQL Server optimizer is a heck of a lot smarter than I am. Why, why not follow this recommendation? And I would blindly implement it and apply it right now. But as I continued learning more and more about SQL Server and as I continued growing in my learning journey, I sort of learned and, uh, more about missing index recommendations and my opinion shifted in the other extreme that I discovered these missing index recommendations are not all that they are cracked up to be. So I came to just distrust them entirely. Now, that being said, as of course I've continued my learning journey and as I've gotten a little bit more seasoned, I've kind of come back to uh, an area in the middle where, you know what, should I use this? Should I not use this? There's a place for it, and that is kind of the core of this particular session. How to make use of these missing index recommendations while understanding the caveats and the drawbacks, right? So again, how can we make good use of this without blindly making use of that? So. To that end, today's agenda is as follows. I always kind of like to start off with uh, uh, kind of like a little bit of a lecture portion with a lot of my sessions. So we're going to be talking a little bit about index access methods. And this is important to understand as a foundation for, to understand missing index recommendations. And then I'm going to do a quick overview and dissect the missing index recommendations as they are presented to you in the uh, uh, SQL Server DMVs. And then the second half of this presentation is going to be all completely about demo. OK. A couple of uh, caveats uh, that I want to be very, very clear on. This is a 200 level session, so I do expect you to understand and know at least what a clustered index is, what a non clustered index is, and that sort of thing, right? So when you, I need to have you, ha uh, you need to have at least a basic understanding of what all that is. Also, this session is not about teaching you what makes the best index and how to create the best index. Some of that you will be able to glean from this material, but people have made entire sessions about how to craft that perfect index, right? That's not what this session is about. It's how to make good use um, and get good information out of the missing index recommendations. Two other things, uh, or three other things from a bookkeeping perspective. One, I'm going to be monitoring the chat. If you happen to have any questions, please throw them in the chat. But additionally, for fun, if you just make, want to make comments, have a little bit of conversation amongst yourselves, please use the chat. I will be monitoring over here, and you know we can have a little bit of interactivity and a little bit of fun like we would with, with an in-person session, right? Two, I move fast. I'm going to talk fast, and this is frankly a 75 minute session that I'm going to try and cram into 60 minutes because I want to be as mindful of your time as possible. However, it would not surprise me if you go past the top of the hour, So, but I'm going to do my best to keep things as compressed as possible. I will have a little bit of time for a Q&A if we go over, but I do want to try and be respective of your all schedules. So with that, let's get underway. Oh yeah, and this is also being recorded as well. So, you know, hey, because I move fast, you can always just go back to the recording. So, all right, let's get into it. 
index access methods and what do you need to know? So if you've been to any of my other presentations, you know that I love analogies. So for today's presentation, we're going to be using a cookbook here, and this particular cookbook has a table of contents in the beginning, right? So let me zoom in here just to kind of show you what this table of contents look like. The table of contents outlines the physical order of all of the different recipes, and in this case, it's been split up into different categories, but otherwise, you know, you have the actual ordering. I got my appetizers first, soups, salads, and so on, right? This book can only have one table of contents, right? Because there's only one way to physical order this book unless I start making subsequent copies of it, right? So this is analogous to a clustered index. Now, sure, there's some there's some uh, nuanced differences, but for all intents and purposes, you know, just roll with me as far as this analogy is concerned. So this is one of the many ways that I can go look up recipes. I can say, you know what, I want to make a salad tonight. So I can jump to page 75 and start skimming through all my salads. But if I want to get a little bit more, um, um, you know, something with a salad that specifically features beets or tomatoes, I still have to scan all the salads, right? So this is not as ideal to use the table of contents for something like that. So instead, I'm going to use a second methodology to search all of my different recipes. These cookbooks oftentimes will have at least one, if not more, indexes in the back that are sorted by a number of different ways. So let's zoom in here. And in this case, we're looking at, uh, you know, the first key value here is the key ingredient. In this example, garlic, right? And then subsequently thereafter, we have a list of different recipes, right? Also included or attached to this non clustered index or this index in the back of the book is the page number. In SQL Server, all non-clustered indexes have some kind of pointer that will go back to the base data page or the original record, right? So in this case, it's analogous to having the page number to the, to the actual recipe on the index in the back of the book, okay? So now that we've set that foundation, let's take a look at this index here, and then this is what we're going to be using for the next uh, handful of slides here. So to break this down, we have our key ingredient, in this case, pork. I like pork a lot. I like all kinds of meat a lot. We have a subcategory, which is different kind of like cuts or types and whatnot. So we got chops, ground, loin, and ribs. And then we have the discrete recipe names. These are the three index keys in my index, okay, in that particular order. Key ingredient, subcategory, recipe name. And then additionally, I have a couple of extra values that are included, but there's no sorting or anything like that applied. So, you know, in this case, recipe type, like a, this is a dinner recipe. This is a barbecue recipe, an appetizer recipe, the cook time. So that way I don't have to jump to the recipe. Maybe I'm interested in things that will be, you know, faster for dinner tonight or something like that. So I want to look for anything that has a cook time of 30 minutes or less, right? And then, of course, the page number, you know, because again, we need that pointer back to the original recipe. That will always be present. So now we've set that. Let's start querying this index. How do I find all roasted pork loin uh, with herbs, right? So with this, I must navigate the index following the key columns in order. Like me as a human, I can immediately just kind of skim through this and just jump exactly where I want to to find that particular recipe. But SQL Server cannot. So in this case, it takes the pieces of information that it knows and then it navigates down. So first we go to, OK, all pork recipes, the loin and then roasted with herbs. Boom, I found my uh, my particular uh, recipe. This navigation where I know exactly what I want and I find that one element is uh, analogous to an index seek operation. OK, so we, we we have all the pieces of data we need to navigate my little index and I can drive straight into the recipe that I want. All right, second example. I want all pork appetizers. So an appetizer is a recipe type. So, you know, here's where my appetizers happen to be. How can I navigate to those? I cannot because my recipe type is not one of my index key columns. And also, even though I have my key ingredient of pork defined, the subcategory is not defined, nor is the recipe name. 
So what I must do is I navigate to port and then I must, you know, because I don't know the subcategory, I must instead scan the entirety of all of my pork recipes in order to find all of the different appetizers. So this is analogous to an index scan operation, right? I have to again go through everything because while I knew pork, I didn't know what other elements because it's only an included column. It's not a piece of navigational information. All right. What if I have all ground meat? Well, it's all, it's not just pork. So then I must do an even bigger full index scan going beyond just pork, but you know, all of the other different types of things that are in this index that are not included in this little subset example. So even though I know the sum category, I don't know that key ingredient. So I can't even start going off of that. You know, this is why index key column ordering matters because I must start with that first element key ingredient. But again, it's not specified in this example, so I can't even start with pork. I have to scan everything that's a ground in order to find all ground meat recipes. OK, next example. Ground pork ravioli fillings. OK, well, I know pork. I know ground um, and then ravioli filling. Well, as you can see here, there's actually two of them. So I can navigate to the first one, but am I going to seek to again to the second one by going pork ground and the ravioli filling spicy? No, I can do what's called a limited range scan. So it's a seek operation followed by a scan operation, but I can stop because in this simple example, I only happen to have two ravioli fillings. So again, it's a seek to a scan or otherwise known as a range scan operation. And as you can see, this is still pretty efficient because I know everything, most of what I need. Here's a different variation of it. All pork loin. Well, OK, I have the key ingredient defined. I have the subcategory of loin defined, and now I just scan all of the recipes that are fall under the loin category, but I don't have to deal with everything else. So a range scan operation can be extremely useful if you know enough of the key columns or enough of the key uh, values that you're that you're trying to get after in order to be able to do that limited range scan rather than scanning the entire thing. Earlier on, technically, I kind of cheated when I said all you know all of those uh, pork recipes. That was technically a, a a range scan as well. It just happened to be a range scan of the subset of you know pork recipes that I happen to have here, but it didn't, of course, include beef or chicken or vegetables and blah blah blah. All right, another example: honey glazed pork spare ribs. So, so and, you know, if you glance at this, you see that it's a recipe there. However, I also need the calorie count for whatever reason. Well, calories is not one of my included columns, OK? So even though I can navigate straight to the recipe, well, because it's not an included column, I have to do something else. I have to go you know, use the page number and look up the recipe itself. So hey, I'm in my index. I jumped to page 84. Now I can find the calorie count for this particular recipe. This is analogous in SQL Server to a key lookup operation. And just like I must do a little bit of extra work to jump to the recipe and then scan some more information to find the calorie count, SQL Server must do the same thing if the pieces of information that you're interested in are not included here. Now, of course, I don't want to include the entire recipe in my index. Otherwise, it's just another copy of my data. So it's always a bit of a trade off as to what pieces of information do you include in a given index or not, right? You know, like is calorie count something that you're after all the time? Well, then yeah, it would be worth it to put it into this index. But if it's only something that's looked up periodically, eh, I don't really care. I'm OK with taking that extra little bit of work to look at look that up. OK, so I hope these examples help you understand how the storage engine is going after your data with these different index access methods. So let's shift gears here a little bit. Now that we've covered index access methods, I want to talk a little bit about data and the data distribution and knowing your data. So in this case with our key ingredients like shallots, there's only one entry or like sherbet, there happens to be three entries. These are fairly unique because there's not very many of them, right? On the other hand, with the key ingredient of pork, there's a whole bunch of different things, right? So it's the point is, is that it's important to understand how many distinct values there may be depending on how many of the key columns you happen to specify because you know if I'm doing range scan operations right and if if the majority of my data is like shallots and sherbet where there's only a handful of each that's not so bad at all but if 
my um, if my uniqueness is is very poor, like if a bunch of my recipes is just like pork, beef, chicken, fish, vegetables. Well, there's going to be a lot of uh, recipes under each one of those different categories, right? It's not very granular. It's not very unique. So range scanning is not going to be as efficient or as useful in that particular simplistic generalized example. OK, so again, it's important to understand the cardinality or how unique your different key columns happen to be. So keep these things in mind. So be mindful of how SQL Server not only seeks scans, but range scans your data based upon the key columns and understand that the key order and cardinality matter, right? And hopefully the previous examples uh, help drive that point home. And I'm glancing over the chat. I don't see any questions in the chat, but again, if you happen to have questions, please don't hesitate to throw them in the chat or even any comments. If you want to uh, heckle or uh, play peanut gallery, that's totally fine too. All right, chapter two. Dissecting and going inside the missing index recommendation. So whenever you see something like this, the green text up there, you know, like this is what the missing index recommendation looks like inside SQL Server. You know, I got some green text information. Um, the most important thing is, is, is that you know, the following index could improve the query cost by 90%. Ooh, hey, that sounds fantastic, right? Hold that thought. We'll get back to what that uh, uh, what that query cost percentage happens to actually mean. And then, of course, we have the uh, definition of the non-clustered index right there, which at one point early in my career, I would just go blindly apply because, hey, this is going to help things. I'm just going to run this. So how does uh, SQL Server manifest and materialize all of this behind the scenes? So inside SQL Server, it uses three different DMVs, DMDB missing index groups, index group stats, and index details. The first one is the easiest, index groups. It's simply just a many-to-many -many, uh, relationship table to index group stats and index details. So it's just joining those guys. There is an, a group ID that uniquely identifies a missing index recommendation, and that's about it as far as the first DMV is concerned. Now let's go take a look at the index group stats DMV. You see a, a breakdown of it on the right here, but the important things to understand is that this thing will store the different seeks and scans that would benefit from a missing index recommendation. So hey, if you had this missing index recommendation, there's X number of seeks or X number of scans that could have made use of that. Now the cost and impact metrics, the cost is the raw value change. So Remember that in your queries, when you read an execution plan, there is a query cost tied to it. Remember that is a unitless value, so it has some value, it has, but because it's unitless, it's only kind of one of those relative things, right? But on the other hand, if I see a query cost of like one versus one of one million, I definitely know that the query cost of the one million guy is, is a heck of a lot higher than the one of one. Now, if it's one and two, yeah, that's pretty, that, that's a pretty trivial difference. Now, also remember that the cost is an estimated cost. I'm not going to dive into this too deeply, but because um, I cover this topic in other sessions of mine about the query optimizer and digging into the query optimizer, but remember it's an estimated cost. So this is what SQL Server thinks is going to happen. It could still be wrong. That's the key takeaway here. Impact, that is the percentage change, right? So, you know, going back to my example before of cost of one to one million, that's going to be a huge impact. Um, but you could also have a fairly large impact percentage change between one and ten, but that's not really much of a differential, right? Because even because again, both of the co relative cost values are really really low, right? One and ten. I don't probably don't care about those, right? So take that percentage change with a grain of salt. You must also look at the raw cost value. Okay, that's really the key takeaway that I wanted to drive home at this. The other D, uh, DMV is the index details DMV, and what I'll have is a CSV list of equality columns, CSV list of inequality columns that it wants you to throw into the non-clustered index, and then a CSV list of the included columns that it wants you to throw into the non-clustered index. So this is how it con constructs that actual non-clustered index clause by combining these three different um, elements here. Okay. So one thing if you were
paying attention closely to the different data points that are available in the DMVs, there's no way to tie back to which queries generated which recommendation. Uh, there's no query hash or anything else like that. So that's been one of the longest running drawbacks is that these missing index recommendations are generated kind of in a vacuum, right? Jonathan Hayes of SQL Skills came up with a way by uh, by scanning through the plan cache. You'll see that briefly in demo later on, but that has a limited value because, you know, of course, plans may be evicted from the plan cache or for other reasons, plans may never even be cache in the first place. However, SQL Server 2019 finally made an improvement to the missing index uh, DMVs by introducing a brand new DMV, Index Group Stats Query. So now I can tie back a given missing index recommendation to one or more different queries that generated that specific mix missing index recommendation. So now I can say, oh, hey, this recommendation was generated by three queries here, but uh, maybe this query is run a bazillion times an hour. OK, so I really want to focus in on that. Or these three queries were only ever run once in the past three weeks. Uh, do I really care about those, right? Um, oh, they happen to be reporting queries for the CEO. OK, I definitely care about that now, right? This is where you can dig back into that level of detail. So if you have SQL Server 2019, make use of that. Uh, again, it wasn't available to us prior, but this actually helps making missing index recommendations a lot more useful in my opinion. Fundamentally, it is a duplication of the index details DMV, so I'm not going to review the internals of it. It just lacks unique compiles. So, hey, Andy, that's a lot of really awesome information. So why do you dislike the missing index recommendations? Well, there are a bunch of different documented caveats about the missing index recommendations. From a high level, Microsoft clearly comes out and states that if you happen to have any quality columns or any quality predicates, the costing estimates for that will be inaccurate. It doesn't say by how much, it just says it's going to be inaccurate. So if you have something like date greater than, like, you know, like current date greater than a start date or something like that, you know, like a greater than or less than predicate, that's going to throw off the missing index recommendation and you know, will be potentially less valuable as far as the impact is concerned because it doesn't know how much data has to range scan. That's what it comes down to. Remember, I talked about range scanning earlier, so it doesn't know if it has to range scan three records or 300 bazillion records, right? So that's one of the reasons why costing here is not as helpful. Recommendation column order. So, you know, hopefully I drove home the point earlier of like, you know, the, the order that your keys are present in is very critical because if you have a misordering, then, you know, if I don't have the first, second and third, but I only have the second, right, you know, then I can't do a, I can't seek to it. I must do a full scan of it, right? But if it's the first key, then I can at least seek to that and then do a subsequent range scan, right? So recommendation column order is very important. But with the missing index recommendations, it's complete garbage. The column order you'll see in demo is not quite random. It's set, but it's not useful. You'll see why. The missing index recommendation is only good per execution plan. This is a critical statement here. Remember that a given query could generate multiple different execution plans depending on the parameters that are presented. But oftentimes you're just going to get one execution plan that's cached, right? So, uh, and then that execution plan is then tied to that missing index recommendation. So if you have a query here where you have a different set of parameters, it may come up with a different missing index recommendation for that secondary plan and therefore come up with a different missing index recommendation here. You'll see that in demo as well, but understand that, you know, it's one recommendation per execution plan. So, and again, uh, our execution plans are also, keep in mind, I touched upon this earlier, the costing behind the execution plan is estimated within the query optimizer. So this is guesswork by the query optimizer. So even so, that missing index recommendation is based upon what the query optimizer thinks will happen. Uh, that's a tangential topic. Again, I cover this in some of my other presentations in greater depth, uh, uh, digging into the query optimizer and that sort of thing. So I'm not going to touch it here. There are more drawbacks that are documented down at the URL below if you want to really dive into those. So I want you to think about scope. I kind of touched upon this in a couple of previous slides, but I really want to uh, drive this point home. I happen to have an example query right here. Look at the where predicate here, where author state not in a couple of different things, date submitted could be a different variable and that sort of thing. 
oftentimes we're not going to have just that single execution of that particular query, but there's, you know, your workload, work load is going to have many executions of this particular query with a wildly different sets of parameters, right? And many folks are familiar with the topic of parameter sniffing and how that can screw with things, right? So you got to consider that for the given query that you're looking at that has this missing index recommendation, how often is it being fired by your workload? Think about the grander scheme of things and what is going to be changing and how much change are you going to be seeing in those parameters, okay? So it comes down to that, and that's why we have to touch a little bit upon parameter sniffing as a potential headache. Because again, a missing index recommendation is tied to an execution plan. All right, so hopefully you'll, as a takeaway, remember these key elements uh, that I tried to drive home as to, you know, how you kind of want to take these missing index recommendations with a grain of salt. These are the things you need to be mindful of as you're evaluating them. So at this point, I'm going to pause once again, take a quick drink and see if there are any questions. Otherwise, we're going to be jumping into demo next. So it does not look like there are any questions. Y'all are either being very, very quiet or uh, this session, you know, I'm actually uh, covering everything for you that uh, I need to cover. I am skimming through the attendee list and I want to say hello to all of my different friends. I do see uh, some familiar names. I miss you all. I'm glad to see you all were able to join me. Yay. So, all right, enough sappiness. Let's get over to the demo then if uh, no one else has any questions or comments for the peanut gallery. Okay, once again, all of my code is available up on my GitHub, uh, SQL back B E K, uh, and we'll give you the URL once again later. Um, and then I'm using a demo database that's also available on my GitHub called Cookbook Demo. Um, so first of all, these two first demos are just a quick overview of the raw diagnostic queries that I personally like to use. OK, so first I have a missing index recommendations. Summary script, which was based upon something that was written by Bart Duncan many, many years ago. You see that I actually created this well over 10 years ago, right? But this one has been serving me pretty well. You know, it's giving me all the different key data points that we saw. But one thing that's unique is this improvement measure. This was a calculation that was created by Bart um, that looks at the a total average user cost, user impact, and user seeks and user scan. So it's just some kind of raw number to give you kind of that idea or base point of, hey, would this missing index recommendation be useful based upon my workload or not? OK, um, it has a couple of where predicates in here, just a limit uh, where calculated impact is greater than 10 because you know what? I don't care about the trivial uh, queries and that sort of stuff. So just to give you a quick idea of what this thing looks like, we're not going to go into this in depth. This is one that you can play with later on. But to zoom in, you see how we have the index group handle, right? That's the unique identifier for a given missing index recommendation. Here's that improvement measure, random number calculator. So hey, you know, I can see that this missing index recommendation has a very, very large num value compared to a bunch of these others. But you know what? All of these are involve the reviews table. So you know what? I may want to take a look at all of these you know, all together to kind of make an assessment. And you'll see a little, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later as far as kind of, you know, assessing this from that workload perspective. But point more being is that, hey, you know, you see a lot of raw data. I see the quality columns and in, uh, inequality columns, included columns, compilations, compilations of the ex from an execution plan perspective, by the way, and then user seeks, blah, 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 blah. OK, so that's that particular example. The second example is how do I find missing indexes in the plan cache? So this will scour the plan cache. This is a much more expensive query. This was written by Jonathan Cahayas of SQL Skills. Um, I recommend that you do not run this in production uh, unless it's off hours and you can, you know, because scanning the plan cache is a non-trivial uh, operation. But you know what? Now I can then, uh, you know, see what's currently uh, of the execution plans that are sitting in the plan cache. I can see which ones happen to have uh, missing index recommendations, and I can even crack one open and kind of uh, take a look at everything underneath. Uh, someone's Ray says that I don't see the screen. Can someone else please confirm in the chat or uh, can others see the um, screen share, please? If you all could confirm or not, please. I will give uh, folks a moment to reply. I can see it. OK, so I do have a couple of responses that people can see it, so I'm sorry, Ray. I'm not sure what it sounds like the challenge or the issue is on your end. I do apologize. Uh, yay teams. 
um, but uh, maybe Teoba in chat can uh, potentially try and help you out. Um, so, all right, I'll continue on. Otherwise, once again, this is all being recorded, so if nothing else, you can come back to the recording. Ray, I do apologize. Okay, second diagnostic query. So um, this is 1A. Now what I've done is I've added in that new DMV. So this uh, 1A example is only for SQL Server 2019 and beyond. Beyond because we have 22 coming down the pipeline. By the way, I'm going to give a shameless plug to the next use uh, to the next uh, uh, virtual group meeting. Uh, those two, the program managers, they're going to be on talking about 2022 and what's coming down the pipeline because public preview is coming very, very, very soon for 2022. And I'm really excited about some of the cool stuff that's in there that I can't talk about. But there's some really cool stuff coming on the pipeline. So definitely come to the next uh, virtual group meeting. Anyway, index recommendations with individual queries. Now this is an aggregated version of that one. So now I'm going to run this guy, but I have a key difference here in this version of it. The number of distinct queries that benefited from a given missing index recommendation. So remember I saw this guy had a really large uh, improvement measure. Now we know 176 different individual queries would benefit from this guy. Cool. Now I can run the detailed version to look over all 176 one of those. And now I see and that's why this is all duplicated here because those bubble up to the top, right? But then uh, as I scroll further to the right in my results set. And then I'm going to expand this out and then I'll zoom in on it real fast. Uh, I'm doing this intentionally. Give me a moment. So. I'm expanding out the query text because I want to get to a specific point in my query clause. Bingo. So over here, my query text. The query is exactly the same. It was that example query that I showed you earlier on in the slide deck. But notice that my predicate is different, right? And as a result, query hashes are different, even though it's otherwise the same query. It's just different parameters, therefore generating a different execution plan. Right, or potentially in a different execution plan. Um, but in either case, because I have unique query hashes now, because all of the different variables are different, right? Um, that's where we're coming up with that singular. Uh, sorry, I misspoke. These queries are coming up with one execution plan, therefore one uh, missing index recommendation, even though the variables are all different here. OK, that's essentially what's boiling down to. In either case, this extra layer of information is extremely useful, makes missing index recommendations far more useful in uh, 2019 because I can also scroll to the right now and see individual uh, uh, user seeks and user scan. So I can now see that, oh, hey, you know, with this set of states or something like that, I had two seeks as opposed to 200,000 seeks if I had a different example that was used all the time, right? Or something like that. So, hey, I can focus my tuning efforts now. I know which ones are really hammering my system and or which ones would potentially benefit the most. OK, so there's that. So with that, let's get into the first demo, which is all about the key ordering. When I was on the caveats demo or the caveat slide, I talked about how key order matters and how the, the key orders are garbage inside the missing index DMVs. To set this up, I'm going to have two tables here. One is called keys ascending, so they're in alphabetical order. Author, first name, category name, date published, you know, so A, C, D, P, R, S, OK? And then keys reversed, so S, R, P, D, C, A, OK? And then I am going to cluster each of these on the uh, uh, on the um, rec ID, and then I'm just going to insert a whole bunch of data, the identical data into both tables. But again, remember that the columns, as I am defining them, are in uh, different reverse order. OK, so now that we've done that and done that bit of setup, I'm going to turn on actual execution plan and then I have three equality predicates. These are brand new tables, so aside from the clustering key, there are no non clustered indexes on the, on either of these two tables, right? So I'm you know, I, I have three equality predicates. I would expect to have a missing index index recommendation that would tell me that, hey, you know, this is something that will help me seek on all this information. Hey, there's no green text here. There's no recommendations. Why is that? Well, one of the caveats about missing index recommendations, and this has actually tripped me up when I first started developing uh, these uh, demos, is I forgot about one key detail, and I'm opening up the properties tab to show you this. Optimization level. When the query optimizer goes through a given query, it goes, you know, you can have a trivial execution plan, which is exactly what this is. 
trivial execution plans will never generate a, uh, a missing index recommendation. So even though I happen to have a query here that could definitely benefit from a non-clustered index, I will never get a missing index recommendation. So if you're expecting one because of something that you've written, go check that value really fast and see if you <laughs> and see if you fell into that little pitfall like I fell into it. All right. So I'm just adding in this extra superfluous predicate here where one is equal uh, greater than like zero. This is just a force optimization. OK, nothing else. It has no other negligible impact on performance. So now I have some fun green text here, right? So uh, um, hang on, let me just do it this way. Keys ascending. Hey, you know, I have a non clustered index that wants me to create with the key orders, author, first name, category, date published. But do you notice something about key reversed? Date published, category name, author first name. The queries were identical, but the non uh, but the missing index recommendations were completely different. And they happen to be different because of how the columns were created in the column order on the table. That's where the ordering will come from here. That's why I hate the missing index recommendations from the column ordering perspective, the key ordering perspective, because it's garbage. It just it's just an arbitrary ordering based on what columns are in the table and how it was you know, originally created. If I look at the uh, uh, missing index uh, recommendation DMVs, um, you can see that more clearly here. Equality columns. Oops, let me get rid of that that hovering thing. There we go. Equality columns. A, C, D, D, E, A. That's not very useful again. Uh, so you, you kind of see why I have a big issue with this. OK. Here's an optional demo that I'm not going to do right now, but does the order of the predicates make any difference? Short answer, no. So we'll skip that one. OK, now let's change things around. I'm going to add in a range predicate. So I got protein greater than uh, the value of six here. Otherwise, it's the same three equality predicates from earlier. Look at the execution plan. I'm just going to be uh, quick and look at this here. Everything is so the first one A, C, D, P. D, C, A, and then P. Why isn't protein the first value here? Andy, didn't you make a big stink about how it, you know, the keys are ordered in, you know, the table, you know, according to the table definition? Yes, but remember I created an inequality predicate on the with a protein, right? So if I look inside the missing index recommendations DMV, Equality, so when the non clustered index is created, equality columns is first put into place, and then inequality columns are put in immediately thereafter. So it's just a concatenation. So that's why you have this definition versus th this particular definition here. That's why protein still remains at the end uh, rather than going to the beginning. It's not that SQL Server realphabetizes all of these or uh, reorders all of these, okay? If I add in a second inequality predicate, I'm changing category name to not in um, just to further illustrate this point. And you'll see that the missing index recommendation. A, D, my two equality predicates, and then C and P, my two inequality predicates. Subsequently, uh, D, A, P and C. OK, so it's two sets of values that are now being concatenated together, but presented in the order as they were defined in the original table. You'll see that once again in the uh, missing index recommendation here. So this is where it's important to know and understand which of these would actually be better based upon you know, the underlying data. This is one key reason why you can never ever take a missing index recommendation purely at face value. OK. Hopefully uh, you all uh, appreciate that and uh, I drove that point home. So let's shift gears now and go into our next demo where we're going to start talking about some. Uh, we're going to look at some individual queries. We're going to show some different variations thereof um, and we're going to see different missing index recommendation behaviors. OK, so this is the same query from before that you saw in the plan cache where I'm going after the reviews table and the authors table. We have authors state not in. Reviews date submitted not equal to date modified, date submitted greater than a value, and reviews approved 
uh, equals one. OK, so really you, all you need to do is focus on the predicate and just understand that we have some equality or and uh, non um, inequality predicates. I have a different variation of the same exact query where I have a longer state list, right? Um, and then I have a third version of it where state is equal to Illinois. OK, I'm going to run each of these. And then uh, let's see, so I run each of these and then I run my diagnostic query to see what is generated. I need to uh, turn on actual execution plan. So we fire these off. Perfect time to take a drink. OK, so we have some outputted information here. So I have my index group handle uh, I, um, and a missing index recommendation on the approved column and then uh, the date submitted inequality column and then you know included columns. OK, so uh, here's the underlying SQL text. User query seeks because this is the 2019 version. Um, the reason I have much more unique compiles and stuff like that is that this query is actually part of my overall workload, but I I, I trimmed this version down, this demo version down to only look at the most three most unique uh, uh, executions, which is why I'm using this little label thing as a prefix here, right? Now, if I kind of take a look at each of these guys, the average versus, uh, you know, average cost versus the query uh, cost and that sort of thing. So, you know, with each of these, you know, the query cost is about the same, uh, you know, as part of the average. It's not like one of these is like eight and the rest of these are 80, right? So each of these can benefit fairly equally, it seems, is kind of what we're seeing here, right? Uh, and then I want to take a quick glance at the execution plans. I have some cheat sheet notes in here. So um, in this case, you know, we're going after the clustered indexes of both of these guys here. We're doing some index scans here. Um, you know, it's all clustered index scans, right? Because I don't have any, uh, you know, non-clustered indexes on any of these guys. So this is what the non-clustered index recommendation looks like. Uh, approved, date submitted, author ID, date modified, helpful score will be the included columns. We're not going to create this just yet. What I want to do first is take a quick look at some of the elements underneath the table itself. We're going to focus on the reviews table first, right? So if I use SP help to look at the reviews table, one key thing here, the first key column in this non-clustered index is the approved column. So what is the approved data type? It's a bit, I meaning it can only have two possible values because um, it's also non-nullable. So technically it can't have three because null is a unknown, whatever. Anyway, um, so it can only have a zero or a one. Is that have a high cardinality? No, but at the same time, will that potentially help me navigate? Potentially, do the vast majority of my queries happen to have approved yes or no or true or false in them? If almost every single one does, then that could be useful. What is the data distribution? Let's take a look at that. Oh yeah, also there's a SQL skills help index here. If I also want to take a quick look at the non-clustered indexes that already exist here. Whoops, uh, let me just do that. Well, let me do it that way. In this case, uh, I only happen to have one clustered index here, um, and, and that's on the review ID, right? OK, so our predicates are, you know, in th these three examples all happen to have approved is equal to one. So in, if this was uh, representative of my workload, then yeah, potentially having approved as the leading key column could actually be very useful to me because it's an equality column. I can always seek to that, but I should query my data to get a better sense of what is the distribution. So I'm going to do that right here with the select approved uh, and do a count of number of reviews. And then I'm also going to do one of the distinct date because that was a second key value there, right? So there's a lot of distinct date submitted values, but you know, the vast majority of my approved reviews are true. So it's really kind of imbalanced. But you know, knowing our data, is it am I better off you know, seeking or trying to range scan to a date, but then if I range scan on it, I will have a bunch of dispersed uh, approved and unapproved reviews potentially, right? So do I really want to do date submitted followed by approved or am I better off just doing approved date submitted, right? So it, it's kind of that trade off here, but at least we can kind of take a look at it. Now, if I had a lot of queries or approved is equal to zero, then yeah, I, I kind of want to do that for sure to support those queries because that's a fraction or a subset of my data. I can range scan a much smaller portion of this table um, that way if a lot of my queries um, have approved is equal to zero as my predicate. All right, 
So let's test this by creating both non clustered indexes, one with approved as a leading key, one with date submitted as the leading key, and let's see what my three test queries happen to do. We've created those. We're going to rerun the same three example queries once again. Do, do, do. I need to turn on actual execution plan. Let's rerun that once more time. There we go. All right, so we're just looking at the reviews table here. So in this case, and I'm also going to open up the properties tab. Whoops, property. <laughs> sorry, properties tab. Stay open, please, by pinning it here. All right, index seek operation for that first query. So if I scan over it, so this is an index seek. However, if I look at the details down here, I have seek predicates. Date submitted, scalar operation uh, 2019. So what we're seeing here is not a true index seek where I'm only pulling back one value. It's a seek, then a scan, AKA a range scan. That's why you need to look at those gory details. Another way to see this is in the, um, is in the properties tab, which is why I opened this up here. I don't need to see the underlying details, just the fact that we have a start underneath my seek predicates. And if you have a like a between, then you'll see a start and end, for example. But this is what tells me that I'm doing a range scan operation. The other uh, telltale sign is that I have a physical operation of an index seek, but I'm scanning in one direction or the other direction on my non clustered index here. So we're scanning forward here. OK, so that's a good thing. I'm reading a subset of my data rather than scanning the entire thing. That's cool. We want that. Second example real fast. Uh, we also have a similar index seek that is also a range scan once again. And then the third and final one, um, and I'll come back to the uh, which index was used. I forgot about that. Um, a range scan once again. OK, so remember we had the approved as a leading key column or the other one. So this one used the approved as a leading key column uh, followed by date submitted. The other one, the other two used Approved date submitted as well. Then approved date submitted. So in this example, even though approved is the vast approved being true is the vast majority of my data, that non clustered index still benefited this workload uh, because I was able to chop down to a subset of that and then go to the date submitted and do a range scan based upon that. The optimizer saw that if I started with date submitted uh, and tried to do a scan, partial scan on that, I would have a whole bunch of interspersed values and that would not be useful to me, right? So that's why you're still seeing this. So this is a place where cardinality may or may not be useful depending on you know the fact that I'm using any quality column in this particular set of predicates. Alright, so let's take a quick look at the underlying missing index recommendations that are now generated. I have a couple of new index recommendations here. Notice an index group handle uh, 1753 and 1756. These non clustered indexes are fundamentally the same because the equality and inequality column values will be concatenated with each other. But because one query had state equal Illinois and the other ones were like in clauses and such, they were generated as equality or inequality. So this is a case where the non clustered or the, the missing index recommendations will be identical, but they will generate the same exact non clustered index. Why do I bring this up? Because I was in one unfortunate company at one point, I got brought in to be their SQL Server SME, um, and it was an N Hibernate entity framework type company. They were having horrific performance issues, and I had just started there. Um, and because they were having such terrible performance issues, an infrastructure manager who had heard of the missing index recommendations told the operational DBAs take all of the missing index recommendations that were generated and just apply all of them, hundreds of them. I said, no, this is horrific. You're going to have a whole bunch of redundancy and duplication. And the guy, the dude being a manager said, you know, overrode me. And then later on, I wound up spending a good three months cleaning up all the redundancies and whatnot because of junk like this, right? So that's why I took the time to point this particular example out. All right, so uh, let's see. OK, so that's that. So let's move on to two other different query variations. I call this, I'm labeling them as V4 and V5. I've now added in an additional predicate against the authors table, the first name value here. So this one is where authors first names like a value and then um, uh, first name like a more, more discrete value. So instead of the letter A, it'll be like Amber, okay? 
And taking a quick glance at the time, I'm going to warn you all right now, I will be going over. So because I only have eight minutes left and there's probably at least 15 minutes more of demo. I do apologize about that. All right, so we just did that. I want to focus in on the missing index recommendations that were generated against the authors table here, right? So I have some of the ones from earlier. I have some equality columns. I have some inequality columns. But again, if I smush them all together, then you know I can I can um, um, narrow these down to basically two, right? Uh, where state and first name, and then first name state. And this is again where I'm going to want to go back and profile my data to figure out which ones will potentially benefit me more. But I also kind of want to look at you know the query impact and and that sort of thing, right? So the average uh, um, uh, query cost three or five. Now let's pretend these are relative values here. So okay, one of these will actually have a slightly higher impact. These are of course simple demo queries, right? So pretend it's more like five thousand versus. 300 or something like that. So this is where I'm going to kind of want to also assess that and see how these might help me and take that into account as I choose which one I potentially want to implement. But for fun, we're just going to implement all of them. So we got state, we got state first name and first name state. So I will go through all of these and uh, in the interest of time. So basically now I'm just going to rerun all of these and what I would typically do is just compare and contrast. So we're running V1, 2 and 3. And then we're going to look at the authors to see how the original three uh, use those guys. So in this case, I seeked on authors state that particular non clustered index. In the second example. I scanned this time it was a full non cluster index scan because I have so many different predicates here, but this time we actually go after first name state here, but it's again doing a full index scan. That's an interesting choice because remember first name is not in this particular uh, predicate of V2. That's second query. We hadn't introduced first name as of yet. The third one we're doing once again a true index seek here or I'm actually going against state first name. So notice that in those example queries, we're not even using the one that just had state as the key column here because it's kind of redundant. This is an example where I'd rather create a, a non clustered index that has more key columns that can cover more queries rather than one for e that that's very, very narrow with only state, right? State first name will, will also uh, accommodate a query that has, you know, just state is equal to a specific value. So let's rerun V4 and V5 where we did introduce uh, the um, uh, the first name predicate, and then I want to look at the non cluster or the missing index recommendations one more time. OK, so in V4 now we are making use of approved. Oh, whoops, wrong table. There we go. Now we're making use of the uh, author's state first name rather than first name state. OK, and then in the second one, you know, we're making use of you know, first name state once again, right? So because the thing is I can range scan against this wildcard value and then I can range scan against this. So it, 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 it's one of those things where there's probably going to be less ambers. So that's why we want to first name first then state, right? So think about how again, what does your data distribution happen to look like? Now that I've run all those, by the way, I have a different non clustered index that was generated author ID approved date submitted blah 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 blah. OK, but should I make use of this? Well, this is where I go back to looking at the query uh, cost and that sort of thing. Average total user cost is now so, you know, under a, a fraction of one, right? So do I really care about that? This is where it gets into how how many times do you kind of keep going down that rabbit hole of continuing to trying to tweak those missing index recommendations before you say, you know what, this is good enough, right? So notice the cost, notice the impact, because if I only looked at the impact, the impact is a big value of 90%. It's a huge impact, but the cost relatively is marginal. So do we really care? And that's kind of the lesson of that. So I don't have time for the optional stuff here, so I'm going to pivot and go to the next demo at this point. Uh, I'll, uh, we'll hold off on questions until the end. I want to try and complete my demos. So I have a number of different predicates here, and uh, we're going to turn an actual execution plan here. Now, one thing I have not touched upon yet, and I did this very intentionally so. Some of you in the audience may have been like, Andy, why are you doing this? Well, hold that thought. So I've been cheating and only looking at the green bit here. It's like, hey, you know, there's a missing index recommendation here. But as many of you know, there's many ways to look at the missing index recommendations, right? Well, I can right click here and look at missing index details. This is where I got that screenshot from earlier. So, you know, I can look at that. But here's the thing. 
Management Studio does not tell you the entire truth. This particular query has multiple missing index recommendations, and, they're, and the only way to truly see it is to look at, well, there's two ways actually. One, I can open up the Properties tab. This is the one that uh, Deborah has uh, taught me because I always keep forgetting about it. If I select the Select item here, and then I go to the Properties tab, I can see that there are actually three missing index recommendations here. So make use of the Properties tab. The Properties tab has all sorts of really cool stuff buried in it. But frankly, I'm a little old school, and this is not the one I'm used to doing. The one I'm used to doing is showing the execution plan XML. Because inside the XML, um, then I can see where the uh, uh, the missing index recommendations are. So missing indexes, blah, blah, blah. I have my first recommendation, my second recommendation, and my third recommendation here. So I don't know about you, but I hate looking at XML. So what I prefer to do is to use a free industry tool called Plan Explorer. And if you know me, yeah, you know I used to work for Century One uh, for many, many years. Um, so you know you can do a right click um, and then pop this open up in uh, um, Century One Plan Explorer, now owned by a different company. But yeah, long live Century One. <laughs> and I can right click on this guy here and then go to missing index details. And then if I open up this window, aha, now I see all of my missing index recommendations. That's cool. What's even cooler though is Plan Explorer has a one unique tab um, that no one else does. And it allows me to, so I'm going to select one of the different operators. I do have to go get an estimated plan once again. So I need to do this. I got to uh, right click, copy statement to command text. I got to, so then what we do is that I'm going to rerun this query by getting an estimated plan against the server. It gets statistics information behind the scenes and other things like that. So that way I can now see that, you know, hey, look, in the index analysis tab, I can look at the different um, uh, columns that are here. I can look at the non -cluster, uh, the clustered index. If there's additional non clustered indexes, I can look at those. And I can also see the definition of the missing index recommendation. And then I can see the underlying statistics histogram to better understand if this was my leading key column in this example, ingredient ID, what would my data distribution look like, right? So I can see this histogram down here. These are the different, you know, IDs, right? So, hey, this one happens to have a bunch. This one happens to have a whole ton, so on and so forth. So what does that data distribution look like from the stats histogram perspective? This is a session entirely in of itself, the statistics that is. Actually, if I'm accepted for past summit, this is one of the ones I put in for past summit that I want to develop for later this year, fingers crossed. Anyway, so I'm not going to spend more time with this. There's an entire uh, recording that I happen to have in my resources, but I want to quickly pivot to my final demo, which is also a quick overview uh, with additional recordings. This is where I talk a little bit about workload analysis because the missing index recommendations are generated for your entire workload. So on the entire server. So if you have uh, one server with many databases on it, as most of us do, you're going to have a whole bunch of different data in there. I'm going to be running the, um, uh, the aggregate version of this uh, for 2019. And what I actually like to do is grab all of this information, the output of it, and I like to dump it into Excel. Whoops. So I have this Excel template here that has all the column headers and all that kind of stuff already put into it. Of course, there's a copy of it on my GitHub. And then I like to filter down. We're already just doing one database here, but I'm now going to just you know use this to permutate through and do some filtering. And this way I can quickly zero in on my heavy hitters. Maybe I'll start with the improvement metric and kind of look at that. And then between that one, now, OK, let's focus in on recipe ingredients as one example. OK, now that I'm looking at recipe ingredients, maybe I'll s subsequently sort by the quality columns and then inequality columns to see where I can compact or consolidate some of these different recommendations and that sort of thing. Maybe I'll put in a filter against number of queries, right? Because maybe I want to make sure it's greater than at least five or 10 or some arbitrary value. Because if again, if it's that one off, maybe I don't care about it, right? So this is where I'm going to make use of doing this from a workload analysis perspective. And typically when I've done a workload analysis, I have you know tons and tons of information and hundreds of records here. So making use of filters and stuff in Excel will make it a lot easier to identify that low hanging fruit, the top five or top 10 that you want to attack first. So there is a 2017 version down here or 2017 and prior if you don't have 2019 and can't make use of this. So to that end, if you want to dive more into either Plan Explorer or workload analysis, 
there's these two recordings of prior sessions. I had an older session, my very second session, called duplicate missing and uh, duplicate redundant and missing indexes. So I do cover a little bit of missing index content in that original session, but it also cover, talks about duplicate and redundant stuff. And then there's a segment about workload analysis where I spend a heck of a lot more time on that one. This is like four or five years old. And then I have another video out there where I deep dive further into using index analysis with Plan Explorer. So this is your takeaway. This is your homework. This is how I'm jamming more content into here. So with that, let's kind of wrap things up and then I'll stop and uh, take any questions you all may have. I, as you can kind of see with missing index recommendations, hopefully you have a better understanding that there is no black and white. It's not always use it, never use it. There's always a gray area in the middle and you need to do more digging. So my parting thoughts to you is never, never take one at face value. That I think we can all agree on, especially because of the column ordering caveat. But do take into consideration the context, such as the parameter values and the distribution and frequency of it, the frequency, and then your underlying data. You know, wh how, you know, what is the uniqueness of those different key columns and key values? And then also knowing your data, is it something where, you know, because most people think about, can I seek or can I scan? A lot of people don't think about the power of the range scan. That's what I really want to drive home to. A range scan can be a very powerful operator because even though you only see an, an, an index seek in the, in the um, execution plan, you know, underneath the covers, you can see that there are range scan operations. And as we saw in the lecture earlier, a range scan can still be extremely beneficial. So take into account what your data is, what your predicates are. Can I get away with a range scan operation? is really kind of what I'm trying to drive home because those can be very, very powerful to help your workload and reduce the amount of work and IO that happens behind the scenes. So with those parting thoughts, there's a whole bunch of learning resources here, uh, so I'm not going to go through those, but you know those are some really cool things. Again, it's all up on my GitHub, and my GitHub URL is down at the bottom, including uh, my uh, contact information and so on and so forth. And I'm only four minutes over. Not too bad, right? Um, so with that, let me stop and ask if there are any questions. If there are no questions before I continue, please give me a little bit of feedback in the chat, if nothing else, before you drop off. Give me like a one or a zero or a minus one or something like that, or you know, just so I can get an idea of like a thumbs up, the equivalent of a thumbs up or thumbs down, right? Uh, just so, so I can get some feedback, uh, just to, you know, you know, if there's, uh, um, you know, what you all thought of the session, if I met your expectations or not, and if I didn't, please give me some feedback as to how I can improve or what I can communicate better. Um, otherwise, let's take a look at the questions that are coming in. OK, I recently had an issue with a very small table, two rows, 20 columns, and simple select or delete would take up to three seconds with no loader, no weights estimated, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. What could have caused this issue? A very small table. I'm going to guess locking and or triggers behind the scenes. Um, but without knowing what else was going on in that SQL server, I'm going to guess it was it was a lock or lock escalation type issue, something else while I was holding on to it, preventing you from doing a delete on it. Um, you know, or um, or someone else doing that delete, therefore blocking. So I would look into blocking. Um, or, yeah, so it, it, I would look into blocking um, for that particular issue max. Does a key lookup play into missing index info? So the missing index uh, recommendations will give you um, all of the all of the columns that do not have a predicate will be thrown into the included columns uh, of the missing index recommendation. This can be a problem if you're doing something like a select star because then you'll have all of the other columns that do not have a predicate thrown into the included columns. It's just a blind throw into the included columns. So you know that will help you mitigate a key lookup operation, but is it all of the columns of your table? So therefore, do I really want to duplicate the entire table as a non-clustered index once again? Again, it comes down to trade-offs. So yes, it does kind of in brute force. That's the word I was looking for. A brute force tries to mitigate key lookups by again, including everything else that does not have a predicate on it. All right. Thank you for some more plus ones or you know comments and that sort of thing. I appreciate that. So uh, um, looking to see if there's any. Uh, yes, uh, Deventra, I warned you all at the beginning. I move very fast. That's why this thing is being recorded. Um, instead of having to speed me up at one and a half times, you can just watch it at normal speed. I'm sorry, it's just the nature of my presentation style because I try and cram so much information into such a short period of time. I know I'm fast. That's why I warned you at the beginning. I apologize, but that's what you get. All right, let's, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, what do you think about using index hints to force seek? 
which scenario you think works for that? I dislike using index hints, especially forcing seeks and forcing scans. I will only use it in extremely limited um, capacities because here's the thing. While it may help a scenario today, your data changes, your data evolves, your workload changes. So while you may be able to second guess the optimizer today, are you actually developing against production data? A lot of us are not. A lot of us are working only against development. But if you're testing in production or you have a copy of production, right? Maybe you can know that information. So it may be helpful for you, but it, to me, it's something very dangerous because you're stuck with it until, you know, because if things change, if your data changes, that force seek can turn into something called uh, individual or multiple seeks. Uh, I have examples of this in some of my other presentations where instead of a so um, so state in and then like a bunch of different things, instead of doing one seek, it'll do a bunch of different seeks, which winds up doing a whole heck of a lot more work behind the scenes. So uh, getting to an index seek should not be exactly, should not be what you always want to do. Because if you have multiple seeks occurring behind the scenes, that could be more detrimental than a full index scan. So uh, again, I have demos of that in some of my other presentations, um, but consider that the number of executions, the number of seeks that happens behind the scenes may be costing you more. So uh, thank you, blah, 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 thank you, blah, blah, blah. Carl, I do not know if I'll be in that uh, user group in July. I think I might be. I don't remember my schedule. Um, how much does implicit conversion affect performance? Fantastic question. And for that, I'm going to refer you back to my very first presentation, why your data type choices matter. So go to YouTube, go Google my name, and look up why your data type choices matter. I have an entire presentation about why data type choices matter, including a whole chapter on implicit conversions. But implicit conversions can burn you and can burn you hard. That's the short answer. For that two row table, is it possible to be a heap and a high number of modifications to those rows? Yes, Teo, that you make an excellent point there. So, uh, there's a caveat with heaps, something called forwarded records as well. So depending on how that data has been manipulated, um, you could wind up with a whole bunch of extra data pages and a whole bunch of stuff that gets forwarded all over the place. I can't remember if I cover that in my data type session or not. If not, go look up heaps and forwarded records and you'll learn a little bit about some of that extra IO and that extra work that happens to happen behind the scenes. The other thing to do is if you're running that test query uh, off the top of my head is turn on Ses statistics IO and Ses statistics time. The IO will tell, value will tell you if you're doing a whole heck of a lot of work behind the scenes and that will give you uh, a kind of a hint or an indicator if, if you happen to have a heap and whether there's forwarded records because again if it's only like 20 records but you have like you know 500 logical reads okay you probably have forwarded records or a ridiculously wide table um, or and then set statistics i will show you the true time on sql server of the execution as opposed to round time between uh, ssms when do you create column store index I don't cover column store indexing. That's not one of my specialties. Um, there are entire presentations all about column store and only about column store. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that question for you. But column store, I will tell you, can be very, very powerful in the right use cases. But uh, that's not something I can touch upon. Again, entire sessions just about column store alone and where they're useful and not useful. Someone has their uh, hand raised. Um, uh, uh, Jose, your hand is raised. You want to? I cannot unmute you, so you have to just type it in the chat if you uh, have a question for Andy. Or I don't know if that was by mistake, so. It's all right. I'll stick around for another two, three minutes, uh, see if there's any additional questions that come on in. Otherwise, I will have to bounce out. But thank you all for hanging out with me. I really, really appreciate it. And once again, please toss in the chat uh, whether you have any comments or anything like this. Can you please share your YouTube channel link? Again, everything just goes down to SQL Beck or my name. Just search my name and SQL Server inside YouTube. I don't actually have it. I don't remember what I don't have a designated like, you know, friendly URL for the channel. So uh, just search under my name. Um, all right. Any other comments or oh, do you suggest?